Okay, I've started the recording, I believe. Trying to make sure I started the recording. Dan, can you tell? I know Dan's on the line. Can you tell that I've started the recording? It's always a challenge with this technology. I think so, Cheryl, because it says pause or stop, so that implies right. that it's going. Just didn't see a little red light. That's what I was looking for. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to the May SAN Coordinators Call. Can't believe it's the end of May already. I hope everyone had a very nice uh, Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we will get started here in just a minute. Um, you'll see that we have a variety of things to cover today, and uh, something of, of major importance is the lawsuit that um, there was a court ruling in the U.S. District Court back in April, April 26th, and we've invited our friends from Hogan Lovells uh, to be on the call with us today. Greg Fahrenbach will be speaking um, to us about this, um, about the outcome and the ruling in this case that had to do with the delay of the state authorization regulations that were to be coming into effect last July that were delayed. So he will speak to us about that. He has his team with them, uh, Stephanie Gold, Ray Lee, and Jeannie Yaki Fine are all with Hogan Levels. And so uh, they will be um, with him to be able to add comments as needed. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Greg because we want to let him have uh, as much time as he needs. Greg, are you on the line with us? Yes, I am. There he is. Greg, it's great to have you. I really appreciate you being on the call with us today. I, I am just trying to make sure that this recording is going because this is just going to be so important, uh, the information you share with us. But I believe it is, even though I can't see a red light anywhere. Um, so, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, Greg Fahrenbach has been a longtime friend of SAN, and so it's, it's really great that he would take the time to do this. So, Greg, take it away. You're, you're welcome, Cheryl, and um, thank you very much. I'm not sure which of my colleagues are on the phone. Um, these are just my thoughts on uh, NEA uh, versus DeVos. And um, so if uh, Stephanie or Jeannie or Ray have a few further comments before we get to questions, I invite them to just come off, come off mute and uh, and um, ask Cheryl if they could grab the phone for a minute. Um, so I wanted to go through three things about the case. One is, you know, what what does it say? Um, two, where does it leave us? And three, what to do what to do about it? Um, which of course is going to vary by institution, but I'll just give you my my thoughts. Um, so what happened? Um, this is a this case is a challenge to the department's delay of um, the state authorization rules um, that were put into effect at the very end of the Obama administration, and the the decision refers to to that action by um, the current administration as the delay rule. So I'm just going to use that terminology. So when I'm when I refer to the delay rule. I'm 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 talking about when um, the current administration put the Obama rule on hold. Um, the suit was brought by NEA, um, National Education Association, and the California Teachers Association, and various private plaintiffs who were miffed that the Obama uh, rules had been set aside. And it uh, was heard in the the um, U.S. District Court in the Northern District of California, and um, heard by a magistrate judge, um, Judge Lauren um, Beeler. And one thing about magistrates is they're, they're um, a little bit different. They're not what we call Article Three judges that have been appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. They're appointed um, instead by the um, judges of the district court. And um, they tend to be kind of the workhorses of the federal judiciary their role is kind of to keep the backlog down. Um, they tend to be practitioners. Um, and so they're not out to make waves. Um, you know, they're, they, they, they tend to be kind of judges, judges. And um, I think that that was true in this case too. And I'll say more about that later. Um, so as I think most people know, the Higher Education Act requires um, the department um, to go through a negotiated rulemaking process 
anytime they issue rules. And so the issue in, in this case was whether the delay rule um, was, was required to go through that NEGREG process. So this case is really all about process and about procedure. It's not about whether one set of rules was you know, better uh, than the other set um, or the proposed uh, uh, set coming out of the NEGREG. Um, and this is very common setup in administrative law. A lot of times these cases are really just about whether the, the right process was, was followed. And in this case, in, and um, <laughs> in particular, in this case, was about um, a, an exception in uh, what's called the Administrative Procedures Act that, that provides that you don't have to go through the NEG reg um, if impracticable, unnecessary, or contrary to the public interest. Um, so, um, and, and also what, whether the government gave adequate notice um, of why um, it determined that not doing a neg reg was impractical, unnecessary, or contrary to public interest. Um, and, and this kind of presented a problem for the department because they issued the delay rule really at the last possible minute before it was to go into effect uh, last year, um, almost, almost a year ago, July 1, 2018. And um, I think sort of ironically, the Obama rules themselves the, that, that were set aside were also released at the very last minute uh, before the Obama um, folks left office. So you have, you know, these kind of rushed processes, um, both by the prior administration and the current administration that have caused some um, confusion and mischief. Um, so the department largely argued that it was impracticable for them to uh, go through NEGREG um, because there, there wasn't enough time um, to do a NEGREG before the Obama rules went into effect. And Judge Bila really had none of that. Um, she pointed out, she went through the record in, in great detail, factual record, to point out that the department did not act for almost a year after WCT itself and others wrote about some of the uh, concerns they had about the Obama era rules and, and effectively prompted them um, to do something about it. And then, you know, this is a, a, you know, a year and a half after the election and the department at, the, at 1159 sets aside the rules. Um, so the judge basically said, you know, department, you sat on your hands and you screwed this up. Um, and, um, you know, again, somewhat ironically, some of the issues that the department had uh, with the prior rules um, probably could have been cleaned up a little bit with a dear colleague letter, but the current administration doesn't like to issue dear colleague letters. So again, you know, some of this is self-inflicted wounds on the department. Um, so, so the department really had to show this, this quote, good cause under APA for not having had the NAGREG, and they didn't. And therefore, um, the court held that um, Congress's intent in the HEA um, about having NAGREG had to be respected. Um, and um, since the case law is that, you know, that, that good cause, that exception to the NAGREG, uh, in the APA must be narrowly construed. Um, the ruling is really kind of not a surprise. Um, it's really, it's following um, the precedents here and um, really appears to be a legally sound decision. The problem is, of course, when you get to the remedy, um, because under the law, the, the, the remedy here is that, um, although the judge has some discretion, um, the remedy here it is to um, reinstate the old uh, rule, and that's what the judge did. Um, and in some ways, I, I think she kind of painted herself in a corner because she uh, went on at length to um, find the department that uh, had not followed the law and um, to respect the will of Congress in the HEA. And so then she couldn't very well turn around and say, oh, never mind, um, because, um, you know, that essentially would have rewarded the current administration for uh, violating the, uh, the, um, 
the APA and the and the HEA. So she she kind of got in a position where there really wasn't any choice um, but to reinstate the old law or old rule rather, and then you know that leads to a lot of confusion. So where does that leave us? Um, and obviously, we got two different sets of rules, um, the Obama era ones that have been reinstated, and then the ones that we are um, um, waiting are awaiting public notice that came out of the NEGREG. And there are, in fact, some pretty big differences between those two set of rules. W one of the biggest ones is um, this residence versus location distinction that was pointed out by um, WCT in its letter, um, you know, a, a year and a half ago. Um, and that's, that's in, very important because it, it feeds into the rest of um, the, the different regimes that have been established by, um, in the Obama rule and then and now in the, in the new about to be proposed rules, because you, you can't notify the students um, um, of, of these disclosures that are required in the rules unless you know who those students are and where they live. And the, and the different approaches, residence versus location, kind of creates an apples and oranges situation where you can't be sure that you, you're following the rules because you can't be sure if you're notifying the correct students under one rule versus the other. So you really have to follow, um, you know, one or the other, or um, as it turns out, do, do them in sequence, which is quite awkward. Um, the other, I think, big difference is that the disclosure regimes are, are quite different. And, and the, the Obama ones are much more extensive. There's a, there's a lot more disclosures are, that are required, again, keying off where the student um, resides rather than where they're located. Um, one thing that comes out of the neg reg that I think is important and really perhaps not expected is that the um, the rules that the rules that are to come will also require disclosures about professional licensure, but they're not exactly the same as the disclosures that are required under the Obama rules. So. You know, it's really a, a kind of a, an unfortunate result, this case, because although it may have been uh, legally sound in its reasoning, the result that it re reaches uh, is one that's just sure to create confusion. Um, in preparing my remarks, I went back and I, and I, and I dug out a um, presentation that Jeannie and I did um, a couple of years ago for NASAPS um, that goes through the Obama rules in pretty good detail. And um, um, I think maybe, Cheryl, with NASAPS permission, that might be a good thing to put up on your site um, or otherwise people can just email me. I'll send it to them. But I think it's a pretty good cheat sheet uh, for the Obama rules um, it, for institutions that may not be. Uh, completely compliant with them to see what those rules are. And then you can kind of compare them to uh, the, the what came out of the neg reg and what's soon to come out as a notice of proposed rulemaking and plan accordingly. Um, so the last question really is, you know, what to do about it. Um, I'm, I'm not um, counsel to WCT and you know what you decide ultimately to do about this model at your institution is going to depend on facts that that I may not be privy to. So so that it's not really my place to give you legal advice about this. Um, but I, I do think my conclusion about the case is that you really don't have much choice but to follow the Obama rules and then switch over to the new rules. Um, um, and, the, and the reason I say that is because um, I, I think there's two sets of risks here. There's the department's risk uh, if you don't follow the, 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 uh, the Obama rules first and then follow the new rules. And then there's the state law risk. And I think the trap 
for the unwary from this decision is really in the second set of risks, the state risks. Um, so the department, you know, one might infer not happy about this decision. Uh, they may not be too vigorous in enforcing it. Um, and if they did, you know, I think mostly, I mean, again, again it depends on what part of the um, rules is violated, but in most cases, I think it would be more in the nature of a misrepresentation situation. And so you're going to get as, um, you know, your risk, the, the different administrative actions that the department could take um, with regard to misrepresentation that can include fines and, and whatnot. Um, it seems unlikely to me that um, violating uh, the Obama era rules, depending again on what part of those rules we're talking about, would be an eligibility issue that could then create a lot of exposure for the institution in terms of whether the Title IV was dispersed properly, but that's certainly a possibility depending on what part of the rules. Um, so, those, so that's what you're dealing with with the Department of Education. Um, but there's another part, and that, that, that's the state law risk, because even if the department did not enforce all of these rules vigorously, what they are is, to, seems to me, is, is they, they stand as evidence of what proper disclosure should be to students, and therefore as evidence in state misrepresentation type claims of what should or shouldn't have been done and what duties were due to students. So um, I, I think that even if the department doesn't enforce the Obama era rules, the some of the state AGs will point to them as the standard and that that could um, be problematic for schools that don't follow them and get caught up in suits at the state level, state AG level. And then of course, our friend, the bar defense to repayment rule could then kick in if um, there's adverse findings at, at the state level. Again, that rule is kind of also in flux, but at heart is um, statutory under um, the HEA. So uh, it's a consideration as well. So, the takeaway really is that you need you need to uh, revisit your compliance plan. If you're not compliant with the Obama era rules, you have to figure out um, how or, or why um, you aren't and uh, make a plan to come into compliance with them um, and then transition um, as uh, transition to the new rules as they come into effect. So let me pause there and see if any of my colleagues um, has additional uh, points they would like to make, and then I'm happy to answer questions. If they're having difficulty in um, getting themselves off mute, let me know and I can try to, um, to fix that. Uh, they should be able to do it themselves. While while they're formulating their questions, um, Greg, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, where would be the department, if the department were to provide a dear colleague at this point to talk about enforcement versus effective, um, could they do that? Is that within the realm of possibility similar to what happened um, with the uh, original 2010 um, federal regulations for state authorization of distance education. Other, this was before the lawsuit. They that regulation 600.9 C had be, had come into um, it was effective, but they delayed enforcement. This was before the lawsuit. Um, could yeah. they do that again, or would that be really um, would not because there's a court ruling? Would that keep the department from being able to do that? Well, I, th I think it really would. Um, I mean, and they, they might be inviting an, another suit if they, if they did that. Um, it, I mean, they, they, they might consider it as an option. Um, but I would be surprised if they were completely overt about it. 
Thank you. Would you mind if I asked for folks to just ask you questions at this point? Oh yeah, that's fine. Unless Jeannie, Stephanie, or Ray have any other thoughts they want to add, the floor is open. And, and this is Jeannie. I, I realized, Cheryl, that I was talking earlier and I was on mute, so <laughs> I, uh, Easy to do. <laughs> yes, I, I figured that out. And actually, in saying that, um, after your last question, I actually don't have anything to add at this point. So thanks, Greg. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Jeannie. I, I have um, just one comment to make about the cheat sheet that was from your previous presentation. I will look into that and, if, and I will post it uh, on the website. If I do not have access to it directly, um, I will uh, be in touch with Greg and with NASAPS to be able to provide that for the membership. Thanks for offering that, Greg. You're welcome. Cheryl, this is Russ. Hey, Russ. Hi. Hello, Greg. Thank you very much for, for this. Hey, Russ, welcome. Uh, yes. Um, it, it, the, the question I have is about uh, advice about uh, uh, students in, in California. So if you're an outside of California, public or nonprofit, and there's not a, any complaint process that you can point to within the uh, official complaint process that you can point, uh, point to in California. So in this interim, is there any advice you give about what institutions should do about that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, California has, has been problematic about this complaint process all along, and um, as has the department, because they haven't been consistent in um, their position about whether the California complaint process is sufficient for federal purposes. Um, there are different complaint processes in California. There's a consumer complaint process that's available to all. And I believe the department has sometimes said that that was sufficient and sometimes said it wasn't sufficient. Um, there's also this pathway for, um, for not-for-profit uh, independent institutions to um, enter into an agreement with uh, the Bureau that suffices as a complaint process. And um, I know many institutions have, have um, availed themselves of that. So that is maybe the best way to um, provide evidence of state authorization in California, or at least of, of having a valid complaint process. Um, so if institutions are, you know, lo lo looking for something there that they can show the department, that that is good. Um, that's a good option if it if it applies to you. That's the Bureau for Public and Post Secondary Education. Is that right, it? right, right. And and are they taking applications from out of state publics and nonprofits? Well, not publics because they've been pretty clear all along that they have no jurisdiction over publics. Right. But okay. um, you know it's complicated in California, but it. But it, but it, in, to say the least, I mean, it's a, it's, it's almost become absurd. And there's, there's a, quite a few bills pending in California that might make it even more complicated. But um, if, if it's a, cons if you're an independent institution, um, that you may be able to use the bureau's uh, uh, process, um, where you just enter into a, a simple contract with the Bureau that they will hear the complaints. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have uh, a comment. Uh, Cheryl Thompson has a little bit to share about uh, things in California. Cheryl, do you want to come on and, and share that with us? Yes, thank you. My understanding is that the arrangement in California for accepting complaints from institutions was available only to California institutions. Um, and it was for the nonprofit, as Greg mentioned. So it wasn't, to my understanding, it was never uh, available to non California institutions because the whole purpose, I believe, was that institutions their students would first go to their home state. Um, but that's 
my understanding from when they first put that into practice for the nonprofits privates in California. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, I think this is an area, you know, if people are, if WCT, WCET and others are thinking about filing comments when the department issues its notice of proposed rulemaking with the NEGREG language, I think this is a good area to file on because the department hasn't been clear. And um, this really is an issue um, of federal law. It's like, what does the department consider sufficient? This is a problem that's been created by the department. So if they didn't address it in the NEGREG, it seems to me it's a fair game to uh, bring it up. And this is a question that we've asked of the department over the last two years. Yeah, and I think, I think the department itself is um, well served by clarifying it because, um, I mean, if you, if you have rules that um, um, are as uh, uncertain as, as this, then it, it creates a due process problem. You can't comply with a rule that you don't know about. Um, and so it, it, like I say, it's really um, serves the department's interest too, because I think the department is, it, unless they address this, they're gonna get in a situation down the line where they yank um, Title IV from somebody saying they don't have authorization in California and they won't have any uh, real basis for that. And then they're, they're going to be in litigation with um, somebody. And I'm frankly kind of surprised it hasn't happened because this has dragged on for years. Uh, as far as a timeline, uh, could you help me, uh, Greg, with confirming that uh, here the ruling came out April 26th. She delayed the, um, the ruling for 30 days so that the ruling which puts the delay, ends the delay, uh, occurred over the weekend. So there is no longer a delay of the 2016 uh, regulations that um, we thought were delayed July 3rd of last year. So those are now in uh, effective regulations as of, as of the weekend. Um, so they are currently in place. We're still waiting for proposed regulations, but that won't impact what's currently effective until those proposed regulations become final regulations. And then if they're, if they're um, provided as final regulations by November 1st, then they can come into place July 1, 2020. But the 2016 regulations would hold firm until 2020. Is that correct? Yeah, that, yeah that's exactly right. Um, we have a sort of a year gap here before the new regulations are likely to come into effect. And when the judge issued her uh, order, um, as 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 a little bit of a uh, bone to those who are saying that she was creating a confusing situation, she said, "Well, this this doesn't this decision doesn't go into effect. This order doesn't go into effect um, for 30 days." So we we've been watching the docket. We haven't seen any appeal. We haven't seen her extend that date, and so that seems to be it. And that day, that 30 days has passed. Correct. It would have passed this weekend, as you say. And 26th, so, I think. And so meanwhile, we've been trying to follow um, OMB as well to see that something has been shared with the OMB. We don't know what, but something has been shared with the OMB um, in terms of regulations. Uh, from negotiated rulemaking. We just don't know which set. We understand Russ heard that they may come in two sets, um, that perhaps accreditation and state authorization would be amongst the first set that we may see, you know, as soon as they get, um, as soon as they're reviewed by OMB. So we may see something in the next several weeks, which as you were mentioning about public comment, we encourage public comment and would be talking to everyone again about how to do that. Um, it, are you all hearing anything more about where the process is right now for proposed regs to come out? I haven't heard anything further. Um, they, it's something of a black box when they go into OMB. Um, I would be surprised if they would break them into two. Um, but, you know, may, maybe that's true. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I would think that they would come out of OMB fairly soon. Um, 
but there may be factors, other factors at, at work. But I, I would think the department would be nudging to get the clearance from OMB to put it out in view of this result. And, and I didn't mean to say that state authorization regulations would come out in, in two sets. I just meant all of the negotiated rulemaking um, issues that were that have consensus language that it looked like the department didn't mean for all 30 some issues to come out at the same time. It, I think. Yeah. That, so that's what I was referring to, not state authorization. They would probably be lumped together. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think that it would all come out in in a in a big package, but. Um, maybe there's administrative reasons why they want to do it differently. Okay, anybody else have any questions about uh, where we are with this now? So just to reiterate, the 2016 federal regulations are currently effective. Um, we're waiting to see proposed regulations, um, but should we see them, they will simply be proposed, which means that we get the opportunity to review them and, and um, provide public comment, and we would be looking forward to final regulations by probably November 1, which would put those regulations in place as effective in a year, over a year, um, July 1 of 2020. So right now, we have those 2016 regulations are effective. And uh, we'll keep advising about uh, best practices for that. I think Greg's provided a good direction. Um, we provided, uh, I guess it was April a year ago, um, some, I, some things about how people can try to piece it together in the best way possible without the department's guidance. Um, so uh, there are some things in place. Um, you know, as Greg put it out, none of us are your legal counsel, so certainly any plan that you all have, you would want to communicate with your legal counsel to make sure that that is working for your institution. Yeah, one, one, just one thing to add, Cheryl, before we move on to the next topic, that the, the, the current administration, the current secretary, um, has um, been firm in her view that she doesn't want to do dear colleague letters. She thought there was too much, uh, quote, rule by letter that was going on. And those were, you know, kind of fiats that didn't go through, um, you know, a rulemaking or a legislative process. Um, and I guess to her credit, she's been consistent about that. Um, but when one puts out rules, um, the department will always write, um, a what they call a preamble in which they um, explain um, their review of the comments and uh, why they they wrote the rule they wrote um, and pre the preamble is actually quite important from uh, a legal perspective because um, it it says what the department's intent is so in the absence of a department that will do Dear colleague letters to provide guidance. This, um, how they frame this rule package is a real opportunity um, to get the department to clarify some things. So uh, I do encourage people to file public comment on things that are confusing to them um, and because that will uh, give the department uh, an opportunity to clarify things and hopefully make everyone's life a little bit easier. Thanks, Greg. Uh, any other last questions uh, of Greg? Well, Greg, this was very important to have you today. Thank you very much and to your team for being on with us to be able to, to walk through this because it just seems like there's, you know, such highs and lows and, um, and difficult t twists and turns, you know, with these federal regulations to know what it exactly is in place and we know now that these 2016 regulations are currently effective and should be we should be reviewing that uh, for the for the benefit of our uh, institution compliance so I appreciate you sharing that and um, I'm sure we'll be continuing to talk to you as the proposed rules come out so thanks again for being with us today really you're, appreciate you're it. very welcome I'm gonna go on mute okay thanks Greg bye 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 Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Dan now. Um, Dan, are you with us today? I see you there. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yep. Dan, how about uh, if you could introduce Cheryl and talk a little bit about the Sensational uh, Awards and where we are with uh, moving into Sensational 2019? Sure, and just so nobody's confused, um, Christina Sedney was delayed um, 
<clears throat> on an airplane. So we're hoping to get her on in a later call. Um, it's Sensational 2019, almost time for, for the proposals to, to be submitted. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl Thompson, one of the founders of this award, to walk you through the process, explain a couple of differences this year. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to let you know, as Dan just said, you will be getting the information that I'll be uh, telling you today in writing very shortly from Cheryl uh, or Dan. But just to highlight, the Sensational Awards Award recognizes outstanding efforts by SAN member institutions. And we have several categories or three categories for which nominations can be submitted. Um, these categories really focus on something that you have done at your institution uh, that presents a solution that meets requirements for regulators or SARA um, or your institution or your students. And it also would demonstrate a clear, comprehensive and practical solution to meeting compliance requirements. The third factor of it is that it would exhibit capability to be adapted or replicated as a model for other institutions. And we have seen this in the past with the winners where after the winners are, um, are named, they then would do a webinar uh, kind of presenting what their findings were and what their project was and then uh, make it available to use by other institutions as a form of a template. So uh, as far as eligibility is concerned, as I mentioned, it's for SAN members who are in good standing. They can nominate their own institution or they can nominate somebody else's institution and specifically a particular initiative the institution has taken. So this year we have um, on the committee, it's myself and Jeannie Yaki Fine, Allison Rogers of Texas Women's University, who was a winner last year, and Lisa Seeker of The Ohio State University, who was a winner in 2017. And what we do is we, the, all the uh, nominations are submitted to us, we review them, uh, we score them, and then we meet together uh, virtually and determine who should get the awards for which categories. There is recognition involved with the, for the, those that are awarded. Um, you'll see that in the information. And um, this year, one of the things we're doing differently is we provided a template form for the nominations. What we were finding is it sometimes became a little bit difficult to follow or find certain information that we were looking for because we hadn't specified a type of format. So this is just going to be a template for you to follow to help ensure that you don't miss something and that uh, we kind of have some consistency and it'll be better, uh, better for us to look at it and evaluate it. Um, so the three categories we have for this year are two of them are repeats and the one is a new one. The first one is uh, has to do with licensure programs, something that you have done regarding notification and disclosures for your professional licensure program status in each state. And of course, this uh, with this um, law now being in effect that was not before, uh, this brings us back to, to the surface significantly. The second category is the location and data reporting. How do you, what process or system do you use to identify where your students are while they're taking online courses or participating in an internship or practicum and then how do you report this information and so if you've set up a system at your institution to do this yeah i highly encourage you to submit that as a nomination because there are a lot of institutions who are still trying to figure this out and i know of some institutions that have been able to find solutions that have not cost an, an exorbitant amount of money, but still meet the requirements and get them on the right track. Um, so there'll be more details in what you received. A couple other things that I want to mention. The deadline this year for applying is July 1. 
Uh, what we have seen in years past is it seems that everybody waits till about three days before the deadline, which you can do. Um, but it, the deadline this year is July 1. And you will be getting a link to a form that you'll, you'll use. We will be evaluating the submissions during July and August, and the winners will be notified on August or by August 31st of this year. And then there'll be presentations made at the WCET conference for the winners. So that's the information I have to highlight today. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer or anybody that's on this call that are that's on the committee can too. Thank you for explaining all that, Cheryl. The, the only thing that I'd like to add is that something that we have noticed is that if you do choose to nominate a colleague um, that's at another institution, we strongly urge you to communicate with that colleague to make sure that you have all of the specific information that helps benefit that, you know, the explanation of that colleague's um, work. Um, sometimes when a colleague does the nomination, they may not have all the information. So we would suggest that you make some kind of communication to make sure that you have a thorough explanation um, of their good work. And you can find, as you see here, you can find uh, the information is on the website as well. But we'll send it out on the listserv, but it is already available on the website. Anybody else have anything to add or questions? We have had tremendous um, submissions in the last few years. I think we had a record number of submissions last year um, and they were all very good. And so what you saw in terms of the awardees was just, you know, obviously um, it was difficult to come to the final um, decisions and they were top notch, but there were others that were very good as well, um, but just were not awarded. So we do encourage you um, to nominate um, for the award. You're doing great work. We hear of the things that you all are doing and, and find that uh, sharing with your colleagues, not only it, it helps you um, validate what you're doing at your institution, but also I find that uh, many of you are, are doing good work and then you're going back and you're tweaking your good work and it's just working even better uh, for the benefit of your institution. So please share your, your work in this way because we'd love to recognize you. Dan, do you have anything else that you'd like to share about Sensational? Um, no, not this time. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks for introducing Cheryl. And Cheryl Thompson, thank you very much for, for being on the call to uh, share with us another year of Sensational Awards. We have the link right there on it, and that will come at, that will be posted on the website. And you can find it on the Sensational page on the SAN website. Okay, just very quickly uh, about SAN renewals. Um, we're in the process of renewals, meaning that those who have changes, who they have different coordinators, different contacts, um, they are contacting Dan right now, contacting Dan Silverman. Um, you received a notice about how SAN renewals would work for this year. There's no change in fee uh, for this year. And so any just changes within your membership would go to Dan. And then after June 1st, you will start to see the invoices come out. We, our invoices are done um, individually. So um, some people thought that it was an automated um, uh, sending out of the uh, invoices. It's not done that way. It's done individually. So uh, if you could please, you know, help us um, in being patient, they are coming. Um, there's no um, penalty. Um, we, we like them in the, the payments made by July 1, but there's no penalty. Um, we just try to put it within a time frame. So uh, the invoices will be starting to come out relatively soon. And so if you have no changes, you will be just automatically renewed for the next year. You don't have to be in contact with us. We're looking forward to a very strong SAN 9. Obviously, we have lots to talk about with um, now we have the uh, effective date of the 2018, 16, excuse me, 2016 regulations um, and the proposed regulations moving forward. So um, we anticipate. So it will be a very interesting year as we look at all of this. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan again. Um, we have been talking about um, our summer uh, project being about podcasts. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan for our plan. Okay, just quickly, um, 
introduction, Cheryl and I are trying an experiment where we are, we are um, expanding into the role of content creators as podcasters. Um, we're going to try it this summer with a series of three podcasts and just see how far we fly up the iTunes charts to decide if we're going to continue doing it. Um, and it's going to be a 30 minute podcast. We'll, we'll do one, um, one in June, one in July, and one in August. So perfect for those, for those trips to the beach and, um, air, airplane and all your other summer travel plans. Um, for the first one, when we're still, we're still playing around with format and, and, um, and guests and, and different segments. And we really want to get, find ways to get input and feedback, input and participation, pardon me, well, and feedback too, um, from the SAN members. So the first way we're doing that is um, I sent out a link on this, on this itinerary, on this agenda for this call is a link to a document where you can please put down the questions you'd like to hear um, us ask Russ. Russ Poulin is going to be our first guest. Not sure he knows that yet, actually, but Russ, it's going to, it's going to be you. And um, hey, wait. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're busy. Um, and uh, so, so we know Russ is such a, is such a great, um, such a great resource and, and such a great personality. And, and I'm sure that you all have questions that you want to hear him in a, in a, maybe in a slightly less formal um, manner. Not that Russ is particularly highfalutin, but uh, we're going to try to try to do that. And the other the other segment that we're going to talk about on the fir on the first so so please enter your questions there. We really are looking for for ideas. Um, the second segment also on this Google Doc is we're going to try to highlight a professional licensure regulation that you've come across that's notable to you in some way. I feel like the professional licensure regulations from different state boards can be very can be very intimidating to jump into until you until you jump into them. Um, and so we're trying to do an entry into that. So if you were working on a project on your campus and you found that the Florida Physical Therapists Board has something funky or interesting or noteworthy, go ahead and throw it up there and um, we'll, we'll talk about it. So these are just a couple of, of, of um, ways we're looking for your input. But if any of those strikes your fancy, please do add to that to that Google Doc, and um, we hope this will be this will be fun. Thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to this. We had decided that uh, maybe instead of webcasts for this, we have often had a summer series that we do a summer series of podcasts, and so. We are looking forward to your input, much like we did, uh, those of you that may remember our virtual seminar, we asked for comments in advance and questions in advance so that we could kind of um, create our um, interactions based on interest of our members. So we'll be doing that. It will be something that is, uh, obviously it's recorded because it's, it's meant to be asynchronous and uh, will be um, located on the SAN website for you to find. We're looking for other venues or whatever it's called, how, look at me for the tech stuff. He, um, I see that uh, Dan mentioned uh, for iTunes. We'll figure out how to do that. I don't know how to do that, but we'll figure it out. But at minimum, it will be on the SAN website and the transcript will be available as well. So we will it will be recorded and a transcript, so you'll be able to have access. And um, I, I'm semi-amused, those of you that are following the chat, um, Yes, and those if you have been under a rock the last week, you would not be you would not know of this, but we are very, very excited that uh, Russ Poulin has recently been named the new executive director for WCET. So we're very, very, very pleased um, that that um, has happened for us. So we're excited. I see some woot woots coming in. So I think others are excited as well. Um, so we welcome Russ in his new role as executive director. Uh, obviously, we'll still be seeing him involved in our work. Um, and he's going to be just doing more and more. And so we're very happy for that. So um, let's see, what else do we have left? I should share with you that the- Sure, can I, can I add one thing on the podcast? Please do. Um, it, you know, I, I put down those two questions on that Google Doc, but if you have other suggestions for how you want this to go, go ahead and throw it on there too, or contact me directly. Um, 
we're we're open to we're open to almost anything and um and um I, I i i made a longer document with a lot of ideas and i'm happy to share that with anyone if if you're if you're a podcast person or you're just interested in in you know wanting to make this a better resource that's what we want it, it's 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 always about you guys so so don't feel limited in your suggestions that's great and, and we've taken kind of some nods from um looking at NASFA's podcast. NASFA does podcasts, I think it's monthly, uh, might be weekly. But anyway, uh, they do a very good job. And, and some of it, you know, it's very informative. And some of it is very um, kind of uh, personal in um, that they share um, things that are happening uh, locally. You know, we've had some ideas about talking about, um, um, you know, Russ has brought our um, movies, you know, to the WCET. Um, monthly uh, digest. And so we, we kind of looking at some things like that um, to try to make this entertaining, fun, as well as very informative um, for our members. So we're looking forward to that. So appreciate uh, your participation in, um, in some direction for us. So uh, just to let you know, we have announcements uh, at the bottom here. You'll see that we have um, open forum second Tuesday of each month. Our next special guest will be Sherry Miller. There's some things that have been happening in Arizona around the area of professional licensure regulations. And we're just gonna have a conversation with Sherry about what is uh, happening in uh, Arizona. So if you'd like to join us, you just come into Zoom. It's open to all members uh, to participate on the open forum. And then uh, in October, we still have some places left for our SAN Advanced Topics Workshop. I believe there's about 10 spots left um, for the uh, workshop. It's going to be back in St. Louis. Happy to tell you, I was just there over the weekend and over by the arch has the construction's gone and the museum underneath the arch is beautiful. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to us being back in St. Louis uh, for uh, this advanced topics workshop. We've been getting our um, presenters together. I think we have a great lineup of folks to be able to work with us about how to manage all of these things that are happening right now with rulemaking, delayed rules that are now infective, and, and uh, whatever happens over the summer with HEA reauthorization. So I think that will be very important. Um, let's see. Any other questions anybody uh, needs of us today? What can we do for you? Okay, well, before I close, I just want to thank Greg Fehrenbach and his team uh, from Hogan Levels for being on the call today. I thank Cheryl Thompson for sharing with us about the Sensational Awards for 2019. Please urge you to take a look at our page. You will see something come out in the listserv because we will start taking nominations June 3rd. Um, Please note that uh, SAN renewals, if you have any changes, we'd appreciate them by July 1, or excuse me, June 1, um, because we will get the uh, invoices out and uh, we are looking for payment approximately July, July 1. Um, looking forward to moving forward with SAN podcasts. We'll let you know when those become available after we've done our first recording and our first special guest, Russ Poulin. And uh, please take a good look at um, the Advanced Topics Workshop if you're interested. Uh, I do think that there are um, a handful of spots left. Um, I hope you'll join us. And of course, the open forum, open forum with our special guest, Sherry Miller for June. Second Tuesday of the month is June 11. So if you have any questions moving forward, don't hesitate to be in touch with Dan or myself. Um, we do keep the front uh, homepage of the SAN website up to date with newest information. Um, so you will find things there if you choose to um, to go to the home page, you will find direct links to um, you know this ruling that we talked about today, um, as well as other um, pieces of new information. So um, it was great to be with you all today. Happy May and uh, good look, good luck moving into June. And uh, be in touch as you need. And uh, take care. Talk to you all soon. Bye bye.